During the Easter 2019 holidays, a new climate action group by the name of Extinction Rebellion undertook 11 days of peaceful civil disobedience on the streets of London, occupying five key thoroughfares in the city and causing major disruption to commuters, myself included, with the result that about a thousand of them got arrested. So what on earth do they want? Well, they've set out three main demands. The first is that our government tells the truth about the climate and ecological disaster facing our planet. The second is that carbon emissions be reduced to zero by 2025. And the third is that citizens' assemblies be set up so that members of the public can be better informed and better involved in the process of decision making around climate mitigation. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its own report back in October 2018 and that said that carbon emissions would have to reach net zero by 2040 if we were to have any chance of keeping the average global temperatures to below 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, something that many observers at the time said was an unrealistic ambition without really radical changes to the way our society was organised. But Extinction Rebellion's demand for net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2025 makes the IPCC target look like a walk in a park. And then there's the citizens' assemblies, a bit like grand juries where members of the public are selected to contribute towards the decision-making process around the right solutions and actions. People would be selected at random and they'd be expected to attend and contribute. So here's the question. If you got called up, would you know what information to take with you? Hello and welcome to Just Ever Think. For most people, the idea of attending a discussion meeting to come up with solutions for saving humanity from its own self-inflicted impending doom might seem like a bit of an onerous imposition on their day-to-day -day routine. And as for what you talk about when you get there, well, it's a minefield, isn't it? A possible starting point might be this 2019 document from the International Renewable Energy Agency, or IRENA. IRENA is an intergovernmental organisation founded in 2009. They're mandated to facilitate cooperation, advance knowledge and promote the adoption and sustainable use of renewable energy. There's 160 member states in the organisation plus the EU bloc. I should clarify that this report only covers the energy related CO2 emissions and not the greenhouse gas emissions that come as a result of intensive livestock farming which accounts for about 30% of our climate problem. That's something I'll cover in much more detail in a future video. But energy related emissions do still account for two thirds of our overall CO2 output. So it's well worth checking out what IRENA are telling us this year. Although they're not advocating reduction measures as far reaching as Extinction Rebellion, they do say very clearly that the nationally determined contributions of all the countries that signed up to the 2015 Paris Agreement are falling woefully short of even achieving the IPCC's lower target of net zero by 2055, let alone 2040. Just to complicate things a bit, there's another organisation called the International Energy Agency, or IEA, very similar title to IRENA, but definitely not the same outfit. This lot were founded by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, in 1974 in response to the oil crisis that hit the world the previous year. IRENA and the IEA recently signed a joint memorandum of understanding to enable them to work more closely together on climate mitigation. The IEA acts as a policy advisor to its member states and other non-member countries like China, India and Russia on the focus areas that it calls the three E's of energy policy. And those three things are energy security, economic development and environmental protection. And the IEA produces a report on these three things every year. Here's their key findings for 2018. Global energy consumption in 2018 increased at nearly twice the average rate of growth since 2010. Energy related CO2 emissions rose 1.7% to an historic high of 33.1 gigatons. Oil demand rose by 1.3% in 2018, led by strong growth in the United States. Natural gas consumption grew by an estimated 4.6%, its largest increase since 2010. The United States led the growth, followed by China. Coal demand grew for a second year but while the share of coal in primary energy demand and in electricity generation slowly continues to decrease, 
it still remains the largest source of electricity and the second largest source of primary energy. Renewables increased by 4% in 2018, accounting for almost one quarter of global energy demand growth. Renewables covered almost 45% of the world's electricity generation growth, now accounting for over 25% of global power output. Energy efficiency across the global economy continued to improve, but it was at a lower improvement rate than seen in recent years. This last point isn't one we hear talked about very often, but it makes a big difference. This chart from the IEA report shows how our energy demand increased our CO2 emissions from 2017 to 2018. This light blue column is the actual amount of carbon dioxide that was sent into the atmosphere in 2017 as a direct consequence of human energy use. This next darker blue column shows how much more CO2 we were on track to emit in 2018 purely based on the 2017 figure multiplied by the percentage increase of global economic growth from 2017 to 2018. So with no changes at all in the energy sector, our emissions would have gone up from 32.6 billion tonnes to 33.8 billion tonnes. But these things did happen. Unsurprisingly, we see the nice big green dollop in the middle signifying the stratospheric growth of renewable energies year on year. But look at this orange section here. The biggest mitigating factor in 2018 was energy efficiency. In other words, using less energy in the first place. Sounds great, doesn't it? Such an obvious and relatively easy thing to do, and saves money as well. Unfortunately though, even here, the IEA doesn't have any particularly encouraging commentary. Energy efficiency was the largest break on emissions growth in 2018, but its contribution was around 40% lower than in 2017, largely because of a continued slowdown in implementing energy efficiency policies. As an overall picture, here's a chart of how we're doing as a species in reducing our overall carbon dioxide emissions. A nice big drop in 2015 when all the politicians shook hands in Paris. Another small drop in 2016, just in case any of those pesky politicians were still watching. And then back to business as usual in 2017 and 2018. So by the time you get your mind around all this lot, you start to understand why climate activist groups like Extinction Rebellion and the School Strikes Movement feel they've got no choice but to make a bloody nuisance of themselves until governments around the world wake up and start getting busy. And that leads us neatly back to this 2019 IRENA report. It tells us, the transformation of the global energy system needs to accelerate substantially to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And they also say renewable share in total final end use consumption needs to accelerate sixfold compared to current levels. So to work out how all this can be achieved, they've assessed what they call the reference case, which takes into account current and future energy policies of countries around the world, and compared that to something that they're calling REMAP. REMAP includes the deployment of low carbon technologies based largely on renewable energy and energy efficiency to generate a transformation of the global energy system that limits the rise in global temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. It's broken down into six areas, the first of which is electrification with renewables. Electricity will need to make up a much bigger proportion of the overall energy mix because we know we can produce this with renewable technologies. In 2010, electricity made up only 18% of final energy consumption. Today that figure's moved only very slightly to 20%. IRENA projects that this will need to be closer to 50% by 2050, with particular emphasis on the provision of electrified heating in domestic homes and in industry, taking us away from our dependence on natural gas. Their assessment is that we're currently well off track to achieving this one. To get us there, IRENA project that the share of electricity from renewable technologies will need to leap from today's figure of 25% to more like 86% in 2050. Renewables are growing at a truly astonishing rate. The mind-boggling scale of China's expansion into solar and wind has driven the costs of these two technologies to such low levels that they're now the most cost-effective form of electricity generation available. As a result, IRENA assesses that progress is being made here that gives us a chance of meeting the 2050 target. Most of us will be aware that the market in electric vehicles is now just about reaching the bottom of an exponential upward curve, and that's also reflected in the IRENA charts. 
with almost 1.2 billion electric vehicles predicted on our roads by 2050. That's about the same amount as the number of gas guzzling internal combustion engine vehicles that are currently trundling around polluting our atmosphere today. So the aim really should be for 100% of vehicles to be electric well before 2050. Nevertheless though, IRENA also assessed this area as making progress. Then comes a category that not many of us would probably have thought of, electric heat pumps. They didn't exist at all in 2010. Today, there are 20 million of them around the world and IRENA wants to see this number rise to 334 million by 2050. Heating and cooling solutions for buildings, urban developments and industries will play a key part in our global transition. According to the IEA, weather conditions last year were responsible for almost a fifth of the increase in global energy demand as average winter and summer temperatures in some regions approached or exceeded historical records. Cold snaps drove demand for heating and more significantly, hotter summer temperatures pushed up demand for cooling. Essentially what you've got here is an entirely human-made feedback loop. We've caused these extremes of temperature through our profligate use of energy and the burning of fossil fuels to provide that energy. And now because hundreds of millions of people are too cold in the winter and too warm in the summer, we're burning yet more fossil fuels to run the air conditioning units that keep those people at temperatures they're more comfortable with. But new electric alternatives are coming online. For example, the district heating network for Aarhus in Denmark uses both an electric boiler and an electric heat pump, part of the country's plan to satisfy half of its electricity demand using wind power. Electric heating and cooling offers important flexibility in demand, allowing greater coupling between the power sector and end use sectors and greater utilisation of variable generation sources. And IRENA places great store in our ability to produce huge quantities of hydrogen using renewable electricity. Splitting hydrogen away from water is a massively energy intensive process, so using fossil fuels to do this is absolutely pointless. But if you can do it with renewables, then you've got yourself an almost limitless source of extremely portable and storable energy, with all the immediacy and flexibility of traditional fossil fuels, but with minimal CO2 emissions. This one's a game changer. If we can crack this, then we're moving a long way towards the 2050 goal. Right now, IRENA are only able to rate this technology as emerging, but as the dollar-driven investors start to see a potentially lucrative revenue stream, no doubt the floodgates will open. And then there's that energy efficiency rate that we looked at earlier. IRENA says we need to get improvements of well over 3% a year all the way to 2050, and right now we're miles off track on this one. Government regulation might be the key here, but of course we need to make sure that the government employees are not being paid by the very people they're trying to regulate. Smart meters in our homes will also start to make each and every one of us think more carefully about our own energy efficiency and consumption. Smart meters didn't exist in 2010 either, but today they're in over 25% of homes worldwide. IRENA assess that they're going to need to be in more like 80% of homes by 2050, but nevertheless, they do assess this area as making progress. And the final and most obvious requirement is a wholesale and dramatic reduction in the use of fossil fuels. I say it's obvious, but according to this report, we're failing in every single area of this objective. And the net result of that is if radical change doesn't happen, then we're also miles off hitting the emissions reduction target set out by IRENA too. So it's clear from this analysis that there are huge challenges ahead of us if we're going to get anywhere near reaching the more ambitious IPCC target of net zero carbon emissions by 2040. In fact, we're nowhere near even achieving the lower target of net zero by 2055. And if we miss these targets, then 2.6 degrees Celsius of warming by mid-century and more like 4 or 5 degrees warming by 2100 are baked in and there's nothing at all we can do to reverse that. In light of all this then, it seems to me at least that the shock tactics employed by Extinction Rebellion and other groups like the Friday School Strikes, far from being a bloody nuisance caused by school children and greasy haired hippies, are in fact a crucially sharp stick jabbing away at our leaders and shoving the issues more forcibly into the faces of each and every one of us, as uncomfortable and irritating as that may be.
In next week's programme, we'll focus on the other 30% of the problem, the thorny issue of intensive livestock farming. That's it for this week though. If you found the information in this week's programme useful, then please do give us a like and a share. And if you haven't already done so, please also consider subscribing to the channel so that you can keep up to date with all the latest content. It's absolutely free to do that. All you need to do is click on that icon there. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.